money, and the, the project there is basically the foundation of the support we have for the continent. Um, I have been doing a lot of job developing throughout my professional career, but as fortunately in stage two, we have to throw together a bunch, and well, I don't want to do um, Yeah. Um, so this talk is not about well, building yet another brain set. So um, let's say uh, you read it in the title, um, a mirror trading what? Mirror trading platform? So when I first joined that project, I had no idea what that all was about. And well, that, that's also mirror trading probably on that, on that <laughs> picture. Um, but um, what this talk is about is actually, well, um, doing financial transactions. So let's say you have a trader who has understood how the markets work or who is lucky trading um, stocks, for example, or foreign exchanges, currencies. And, well, he has a clue about all that stuff and he knows how to make his balance on his bank account higher over the time. On the other hand, you have people, well, who have money, spare money that they would like to invest. But they have no clue how to do that. Um, and uh, now we got this fancy little black box, the mirror trading software that can actually bring those both worlds together. Um, one guy or an algorithm or whatever that could be um, that knows how to trade the markets. And on the other hand, um, people who would like to invest and who would like to tap into those um, trading decisions and uh, apply them to their bank accounts. And so hopefully, after all, um, when they tap into those signals, their account balance will also rise over time and all those guys are, uh, people are happy. All right. Um, the first thought I had when, well, uh, thinking about financial software, uh, but uh, I need to add we are not talking about high-frequency trading, which is a totally other league, but it's still like latency is important. And when we receive an order, it's important to make sure that it uh, receives all the clients uh, in a timely fashion without any delay. So I also thought, mm, Ruby performance mm, may turn out tricky, but fortunately, well, there is JRuby. And um, as we will later see, that works pretty well. So you may remember that magic box with a question mark on one of the prior slides. So what's actually in this magic box? We have, well, a broker that we would like to talk to, to connect to, which is managing the client's accounts. And uh, those accounts um, uh, may not be only on a single broker, but there are multiple brokers that we would like to talk to who just manage those depots and, and accounts. Um, we connect to those brokers via a given protocol, which is kind of an industry standard, but a little cumbersome to implement right, which is called FIX. Um, it's not very complex uh, in the wire format, but well, to get all the details right, it's, it's tricky and you need to have many data models to get that right. Unfortunately, there is an existing implementation in Java which is called QuickFixJ, and we tap into that implementation uh, in order to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, and, uh, well, those, those boxes here, which we call connectors, actually adapt um, the broker-specific communication to what our core system, which we'll later see, understands. On the other side here, we have um, the signal providers that um, supply us with signals that uh, actually, well, um, 
are manifested trading decisions, buying a share, selling a share, um, trading a currency pair, and we also get those signals either via fix or via a REST API that actually goes through a rail stack. Well, we need some component to bring that stuff together, which I'd like to call the core. Um, this is um, a set of um, state machines that actually um, uh, yeah, transform um, the signals we receive into actions that we relay to the brokers on the right-hand side of the diagram. So far, we only have a set of isolated boxes here, but we need some means of communicating with all those components. And um, uh, we took the decision to use a RabbitMQ instance, so everything we have in place is message-based. So um, those state machines receive messages and um, uh, advance the state based on that message content. And uh, yeah, this is um, for the signals unidirectional messaging or bidirectional messaging for the rest. So far, we haven't yet seen a database, and uh, but there is one. We currently use MySQL for that. But the important thing is that only the core writes to the database, so um, we um, can ramp up the concurrency, uh, the parallelism of the system um, uh, much better, much more easily, because we do not have um, a single hotspot uh, by means of the database, but everything runs in here, um, th which alters the database, which makes parallelism concurrency much, much easier. Um, one important aspect, and I think that only, uh, that also shows how efficient JRuby works for us is, we receive a lot of market quotes. So via this fix communication protocol, we not just get, um, the, we, we not just send market orders and uh, don't just get the result of those orders, but we receive plenty of quotes, which means just the price for a given share or a given currency pair uh, each second. So, um, and for our experience, that can amount to thousands of, of messages per second. It's not very viable to store that in a database, but instead we um, push this data to a Redis instance, or more precisely, to a Redis cluster. And um, given our current setup, we process thousands of them each second in plain JRuby. So um, I briefly touched that so f uh, already, but uh, what actually made us choose JRuby for that task? First and most importantly, I think we love Ruby because it's so much more yeah, nicer to work with than if we would have built that thing in, in Java, for example. That we actually picked JRuby was initially a little coincidence because, well, we thought for interacting with those trading platforms, uh, should we build it on our own or should we use an existing solution to interface? And there was this, this quick fix J library that basically provided us with all the basic communication mechanisms that we needed. So we tapped into that one, and uh, then the decision to use JRuby was basically set. Um, later on, we, we also noticed, well, hmm, if we use JRuby, it's much easier to, to scale out the system um, in terms of utilizing all cores, all CPU cores that we have available. So um, that turned out to be an excellent decision in terms of um, parallelism and performance, too. Now, running a JRuby instance or a JRuby system is, at least in our experience, a little different than if you run um, MRI processes. Um, we had a given Java background at that time, but we opted against using an app server, but uh, looked for other alternatives to make sure that um, the processes that we run run in a robust fashion. Um, 
maybe one or another of you has already had the honor of seeing an out-of-memory error, and if you have um, had that uh, luck, you also know that once such a thing happens, um, you well, the virtual machine is in a state that you don't want to want to have, so you need to take countermeasures. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen an out-of-memory so far, um, just a brief explanation. Um, a Java virtual machine has a certain amount of memory that it has available for data, and once this um, uh, so-called heap is, is filled up, um, exceptions start to be raised, and, uh, well, uh, that can happen and at very inconvenient times. So, uh, in terms of, of robustness, um, we, we have an active-passive setup in place where we have multiple instances of the backend running at a given point in time, and only one is elected master using Zookeeper that was already mentioned two talks ago. And um, uh, effectively, when one instance crashes, the other one takes over. Um, but on a lower level, um, we also would like to ensure um, virtual machine health um, on, well, uh, per process level. So um, a virtual machine can also enter the state where it's busy garbage collecting but still alive. And um, we found that the Tanuki service wrapper, which is an open source component, um, can effectively monitor for such situations. So this is a, a little uh, Java library, a wrapper, that can turn your um, Java process, and as such also your JRuby process, into a background daemon. And it will monitor the Java virtual machine for responsiveness, so it will, so to say, ping it um, in regular intervals and see if it's still responding or if it has become stuck for whatever reason. And uh, it will also monitor standard error and standard output for unexpected output uh, matching certain patterns. So that turned out uh, to be a very efficient means to verify and to ensure that the process that runs our backend is actually in a healthy state. And if that Tanuki service wrapper detects that something has gone wrong, um, it will kill the process. First, it will try to terminate it regularly, and uh, when that also fails, it will forcefully terminate it. Um, initially, when, when we tried uh, doing that integration, it felt a little tricky because there was barely any documentation available, at least not for that special component. Um, but eventually we figured it out. The integration is, well, you would say a little cryptic, but once it's in place, it works very reliably. Um, so in the end, this is, well, you don't need to understand all the details of that, of that uh, config file. It's just an excerpt, um, but you can define virtual machine parameters uh, on one hand, and you may need to make sure that the class path is correctly in place, for example. So you need to put the JRuby jar on the class path. Um, you need to increase the stack size from the defaults. Um, and um, most importantly, you need to provide it with an entry point, which is org JRuby main. And uh, that one, again, gets supplied with a Ruby script that boots up our backend service as a parameter. Um, there is one other thing that we needed to, to implement, which is, well, we call it service wrapper glue, because it's just a little tiny glue component that we use to guarantee a, well, coordinated regular shutdown, because otherwise the service wrapper would, would always forcefully terminate the virtual machine, because the JRuby um, virtual machine, the JRuby instance inside the JVM wouldn't uh, shut down in a coordinated fashion. So we also build a little, a little Java class that when um, the service wrapper would like to terminate our code, our um, backend, um, just uh, gets the global JRuby instance and then runs teardown on it to make sure that it actually shuts down and that all the shutdown hooks get notified and so on. 
Yeah, um, next topic I would like to talk about that you also get f effectively for free when um, it comes to uh, the JVM is uh, JMX, which is a monitoring infrastructure for Java processes. Um, and uh, effectively, as soon as you run a JVM, whatever runs inside of it, you get access to JMX metrics. And the good thing about that is that uh, maybe you have an existing monitoring infrastructure in your operations available, and most monitoring solutions do have JMX bindings. So you can easily use that to tap into statistics about the virtual machine, how much heap is currently used, what's the CPU utilization, um, how is the garbage collector doing, and so on. Furthermore, there are also libraries that you ca can hook into JMX so that, for example, the QuickFixJ communication that we're doing also exposes its statistics and its health state as, as JMX. Um, if you don't want to set up a full-blown monitoring infrastructure, which I could perfectly understand, you can also um, just have a peek into JMX monitoring if you bring up JConsole. And there is this, this Mbeans tab, and uh, under that you have, well, it's actually a tree of the different uh, information categories that are available. And uh, below that you have um, all the metrics exposed. Um, but some of those categories also offer operations. For example, for the um, broker connectivity we have, we also have the possibility to use that JMX interface to reconnect a broker or to disconnect a broker or whatever. Well, um, there's also more benefits that we had or that we have from using JRuby which aren't so closely backend related. For our front-end processes, we use um, Passenger um, with JRuby. And um, again, it turns down to, well, we get much more performance by utilizing parallelism um, because we can run Fusion Passenger in threaded mode and have fewer JVMs running because we are actually, well, our memory footprint is quite quite large, so we benefit a lot from being able to spawn a few JVM processes, but get our parallelism through multi-threading inside of those processes. Well, we also had a couple of issues. Some of them are JRuby specific, some of them are not, some of them are already solved, fortunately. Um, we, we have a constant struggle with virtual machine startup times, but we came up with a pragmatic solution that we have commands such as just running plain Rails migrations, active record migrations, for example, that don't need JRuby. So we just use MRI for those um, and have, well, an elaborate set of aliases that for each task that we would like to run um, brings up the right Ruby interpreter. Um, memory usage is also, well, we, we could improve on that. Um, and, um, well, debugging, fortunately, we tend to use um, RubyMind for development, and there, there was a bug where you couldn't inspect um, the attributes of objects. But fortunately, I just noticed that it's solved in 1.7.20. Um, we haven't yet had the time to upgrade to that version, but that is, well, very relieving to be able to inspect your, your um, processes state again. Um, from time to time, we, we hit bugs where JRuby just did things differently than, than uh, CRuby, such as big integer arithmetics or um, divisions where uh, CRuby returned not a number and JRuby through a null pointer exception or whatever. But in our experience, um, the, the support by the JRuby team was really great and those bugs were, were very quickly fixed in the past. Um, sometimes when you get one of those native stack traces, you are also confronted with the a, with a fact that they are, well, pretty, pretty lengthy and you have, well, um, you need to decipher them to figure out what was really going on because you see, well, the, all the AST that has been built as part of the stack trace. Um, 
yeah, fork. I'm, I'm not sure whether it has been implemented in your versions, but 1.7 also doesn't come with a fork implementation, so we need to fall back to, to C Ruby for that. And that's not Jay Ruby related, the last point, but uh, we had a very ugly bug in the Zookeeper master election code where we s all of a sudden had two masters, um, which is, well, the <laughs> not what you would like to have. But overall, um, coming to a conclusion, um, through JRuby, Ruby really does scale for us. And um, contrary to what I would have expected prior to joining that project, um, really scales and uh, is a very, very good choice for implementing a complex backend system. Um, mainly due to the fact that, well, we get the concise and elegant syntax of Ruby, but we also get um, the complete Java ecosystem, uh, meaning we can reuse what's already there, what has been built, don't need to reinvent the wheel. And um, we also get the JVM with its just-in-time compilation and all that stuff. And um, well, while we don't do high-frequency trading, performance is still important for us, but uh, I would like to remark that um, don't be frightened by micro-benchmark performance figures. Uh, in practice, um, when you hit um, performance trouble, it's because you're waiting for I.O. or whatever, or your database. So it's a factor of two in the runtime isn't that important because, well, it, it's left behind by, by I.O. usually. Well, so that would be my talk. Are there any questions? <laughs>